Hey everyone, welcome to Basecamp. I'm Pat. I'm a co-founder of Made for today. I have the opportunity to welcome uh, Andrew. Andrew's our lead advisor, uh, my longtime friend and um, uh, thought partner with with our base camps and for our community. So uh, just excited to welcome Andrew here today uh, for this discussion about mental health. We're coming to the end of Mental Health Awareness Month, and all month we've been running our Mental Health Awareness Challenge, focused on some very foundational, basic practices, all backed in science. Uh, revolving around getting you into action to cultivate greater mental health. Um, but uh, no no better person to, to be here at the end of the month and help us close this out than, uh, than Andrew. So I'm excited for the conversation. And uh, if you have um, any questions at any point, just throw them in and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to make sure we, uh, we address them and get going. So um, with that, let's begin. So uh, Andrew was doing just a little bit of, of or a lot of bit of research before this, this base camp. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me. And I know mental health awareness month is all about destigmatizing mental health and mental illness specifically, but something that struck me that I didn't just, I didn't realize is that from the national Institute of mental health, they said that basically one in four people um, suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder. And this is approximate, but that's anything from uh, depressive illness, illness to 1% of Americans suffer from schizophrenia to uh, anxiety disorders to bipolar disorders. But um, chances are if, if, you know, if you, if you don't suffer from one of these, someone, you know, does, or someone you encounter on a daily basis does. And, um, that kind of struck me. I don't know any reactions to that, to that stat, or is that something that, that you were tracking? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge number. I mean, the schizophrenia number has been known for a long time. And yet I think a lot of people just don't really understand the impact of, of just, you know, 1% of people are affected by schizophrenia it's a huge number of people. If you look at the frequency of other, uh, other kinds of health disorders, I think one of the um, key things to remember is that when they say one in four, you know, at, at some point in everybody's life, they'll uh, undergo a major depression. There's a pretty high probability of that. That doesn't mean that any, that it'll be recurring for some people it is for some people it's not. Um, I think that the last few years, of course, have been particularly stressful for everybody, but also there's now far more awareness that uh, mental health issues exist and there's a lot more discussion around them. So Diagnoses are up, but I I believe those diagnoses are legitimate, and people before you know suffered in silence or suffered, um, you know, feeling as if they were you know marginalized for having uh, these kinds of challenges. I now I think now things are, are changing. I don't remember the exact numbers, but a few years ago there was a survey done at Stanford asking, um, I think it was freshmen and sophomores whether or not they would pursue talk therapy, and um, something like eighty nine plus percent of them said, yes, they would. And um, comparing that to 10 years prior, uh, when it was, uh, that number was down in the teens. So, you know, 15% or 14%. So I think people now are more aware that, um, you know, we run into challenges around mood and um, thought patterns and that uh, we all need to do work to maintain healthy mood and thought patterns. I think that's what brings us to the table here today. And um for those that suffer from really severe mood and thought pattern disorders, um, you know, there's an increasing amount of, of awareness, but I don't think the field of science has kept up with these expanding numbers. Um, and that said, there are some, some useful tools that we'll talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess anyone that, that's suffering from that, or if you know someone that is, there's no substitute for professional medical care. And so, you know, certainly some of the stuff that we're talking about today is, is good for anyone, regardless of where you're at. But uh, if you are really um, fine that you're in a place where you're, uh, you're suffering and um, whether acute or, or from something chronic, uh, it, there's no substitute for professional medical care. So we always encourage people to, to seek that as a, as a first step. Um, but that said, so one in four diagnosable mental disorder, three of four, um, maybe not diagnosable, but still, uh, we all have, you know, mental health is probably something that's important to everyone, uh, regardless of, of where you're at, uh, your circumstances or, or what you're trying to accomplish. And I know mental health is something that, um, it's a little bit of a nebulous construct. I think we all directionally know what, um, mental health means or what it, what it means to have, you know, good mental health, but I'm curious how you think about mental health, how you might define it. And, and if that's too broad of a question, if we have great mental health or optimal mental health, what does that allow us to do? Maybe that's a, maybe that's a better question. Yeah. So, you know, 
the words mental health uh, are often harder to define than mental illness because mental illness is uh, categorized as having a number of specific symptoms, you know, like for depression, for instance, um, waking up at two or 3 AM and not being able to fall back asleep is a common um, symptom of depression or the uh, onset of depression. Yet there are people that experience that who aren't depressed. Um, but if you add to that, um, you know, sort of lack of uh, hopeful anticipation about the future, uh, changes in appetite, et cetera, well, then you can get diagnosed with depression. So does that mean that everyone who sleeps until 7 a.m. and sleeps the night through is mentally healthy? Well, no, you have to lump on some other additional criteria. So what are those criteria? And I, to my knowledge, I don't think that's ever really been clearly defined. So in thinking about this uh, earlier and uh, having a conversation with Pat um, earlier, we started to lay down some contour about what is mental health. I would argue uh, from a soft stance um, that part of what defines mental health is our ability to regularly engage in the sorts of physical practices that help us be better mentally and physically, emotionally, if you will, spiritually, et cetera. But what do I mean by that? Well, so for instance, we all know, and it's just kind of basic knowledge now that um, sleeping deeply and long enough, often enough, is really essential to maintain a healthy emotionality. There's no surprise there. And I've blabbed endlessly on the internet and on podcasts and every, you know, I mean, I, I'll probably be put going into the grave saying that people should be getting morning sunlight, not through sunglasses. Yes, eyeglasses <laughs> and contacts. Or I'll be like, those would be my dying words, right? Um, uh, perhaps. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, if you're not sleeping well 85% of the time, um, you're not going to be at your best mentally and physically. Some people are more resilient to that sleep loss. Other people aren't. Um, we could add to that um, other foundational practices or, um, you know, getting regular movement, right? I, exercise or some other form of movement. Maybe it's uh, running, maybe it's swimming, maybe it's cycling, maybe it's weight training. doesn't really matter. Yoga is something else, you know, physical skill training. Um and then social connection, of course, quality nutrition, which if you really want to make yourself miserable, go on the internet and, say, and make a claim about nutrition because there's going to be somebody that's going to tell you that you're wrong. But the point is that I think everyone broadly agrees that, you know, getting ample nutrition, right? Not depleting yourself too much, nor overfeeding yourself too much, avoiding highly processed foods for the most part, you know, these kinds of things lend people to kind of a, a, what we could call healthy nutrition, social connection. And then, um, you know, at some level, having a positive relationship, and I'll explain what I mean by that, with some sort of pursuit, either school or work or, um, and there I broadly describe work as, you know, we've got people who, um, whose work is to maintain home and, and take care of kids. And, and um, I can say that that's a, that's a ton of work and, and that's work too. So don't want to make it just constrained to career. So what, what do we so we can lay down the kind of basics and then that leads us to a place where we all say, okay, yeah, we've heard all that before. Eat well, sleep well, have good relationships, avoid toxic people, exercise, et cetera. But I think we can actually take a step back from that and say, well, why are those things so useful? Well, the, the analogy I like to use is they is sort of like a, a buoy. They, they give us some buoyancy, right? They give us the ability to weather you know, if you have a hard conversation with somebody, if you're well rested, you're going to, you're going to weather that better. You're going to interpret it better. You're going to be less reactive in ways you don't want to be more reactive in the ways perhaps that you want to be, et cetera. Um, anytime somebody is sick or hungry or something, they're not going to handle things as well. So there's just kind of all these obvious statements we can make. And, and the, the phrase positive buoyancy um, comes to mind and Pat and I, you know, talked about that together. And that's sort of an ability to recover from and return to engagement in these practices really easily. You know, when we find ourselves in a place of not getting regularly regular sleep or regular exercise, nutrition, et cetera, what happens is we there's this diabolical nature to that where we not only feel worse mentally, but we find it less, we find, excuse me, ourselves less capable of leaning into those things, right? When you're stressed, it's harder to sleep, which makes it harder to, to, to regulate stress, which makes it harder to sleep. It's a vicious cycle. And so I, I think for all of us, we can take a sort of a temperature of our mental health by saying, by simply looking at these practices and saying, you know, what percentage of nights am I getting enough quality sleep? Is it 50% of nights? Is it 75? Is it 80? I would say if it's an upwards of 80 or 85%, you're doing pretty well there. Right. And I would say that if you're 
eating well and exercising also about 80% of the time, 80% of days or meals, whatever, great. And if, you know, 80 to 85% of your social interactions are quality ones, great. So, you know, that's all fine and good. And I think that can be kind of a, a meter of your mental health because those things position you to deal with the challenges of life in this kind of positive buoyancy manner. Now, there is a, a real consideration, which is for those of us that are finding ourselves impaired or unable to hit those 80 to 85 percent numbers, well, then we need interventions, right? We have to have interventions, and the interventions can't be the foundational stuff of food and sleep and nutrition, et cetera, because we've defined it as those are the very things that are impaired. And, and so the reason I, I raising this this way and in a fairly detailed way is I think we all have heard that good advice, but there aren't a lot, there is not, excuse me, a lot of information about there about how to get back into those physical practices. And frankly, there is not a thermometer for mental health. There are thermometers for mental illness. So I would like to restate my soft stance or thesis, if you will, that our ability to regularly engage in so 80 to 85% of the time, these physical practices and sleep well, eat well, social interactions, I'd include getting sunlight, each, some sunlight each day, quality, social interactions, nutrition, et cetera. I would say our ability to do that most days is a pretty good, if not very good meter of our mental health, because those things really are foundational to mental health. And the but that can't be enough. So that's why I would call in science necessary, but not sufficient. And then in, as a final point to this, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Pat. You know, I think that we all have these, you know, risk factors, genetic, social determinants, trauma, biology, habits, lifestyle, et cetera. But if we're accomplishing those other things that I just listed off before of sleep, et cetera, pretty well, well, then we also can start asking the bigger questions like the, the, the higher level questions that, that make us happier, healthier people, like how much of our life can we afford to be in pursuit of new things, right? Pursuit of new work, pursuit of new creative ideas, pursuit of new adventures. These don't have to be work related or relationship related. You know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs says that if these basic needs aren't being met, then we have very little energy, if at all, to focus on other things. So again, we come back to these foundational practices, both as a route, to mental health, but also as a meter and a measure of mental health. And if that seems circular, it's intended to be circular. And we'll return to this theme a little bit later as we kind of build out some of the other higher level components of purpose and uh, mattering and coherence, which if they don't make sense now, will soon make sense. Um, yeah, I, I love that the, the definition that you kind of laid out or, or the you touched on this ability to, to regularly engage these practices that help us be better. Um, when I was reflecting after, after our last conversation, something else that stood out to me was uh, mental health is in some ways a, a gauge of the confidence someone has in their ability to make progress. And that progress is defined by whatever that means for the individual progress towards my life goals, progress towards my health goals, my um, whatever the, the goals are, the, the, the thing that's driving someone. But if I feel like I have confidence in my ability not to achieve those goals, but to make progress, small steps over time, then that's a good indicator of mental health. And then to, to fall back into the circular side of things, um, if you have that confidence in your ability, chances are that you also are in action around these very foundational practices. And I think that, and I love the fact that you're constantly beating this drum around, you know, getting good light in your eyes and good sleep and a proper nutrition, because it can't be overstated that that foundation that you're building, um, it's any one thing or focusing myop myopically on any one thing is insufficient that you are really focusing on building a resilient foundation. It's all of these practices so that you don't have to be perfect in any one of them, right? Because as, as you say, Andrew, sometimes uh, um, you're going to miss a day. You're going to, you're going to, um, uh, I always like to say life gets a vote. You're going to get knocked off course and we're not going to do these things perfect hundred percent of the time. But when we can get most of them right most of the time. Now all of a sudden we have almost inoculated ourselves to friction, to adversity, to setbacks, to challenges, to whatever the next thing is that's gonna come. And we can bounce back sooner 
to re-engage these practices and by doing so also um, uh, foster confidence in our ability to make progress. Um, so it's just something that, that came up after our last conversation. And I, I really like how all of these pieces start to fit together um, to talk about mental health. And I, I know, and you, you mentioned some of the, the, the factors around mental health on the, on the risk side. And, and when you look at factors of mental health, there's really kind of broken out into two buckets. One is a protective. Um, what are the things that uh, help buffer us and build mental health? The other ones are what are predispose us to uh, the risk around mental health. And so risk um, in large part are things that are outside of our control around genetics and social determinants and uh, maybe trauma that we've experienced or even the way that um, our bodies might be uniquely designed, our biology. Those are things out, maybe outside of our control, but on these foundational practices that, that Andrew, you underscore and, and highlight, these are things that are mostly within our control. These are our habits. These are our lifestyles, things that we make decisions to do and then get into action around um, uh, to build this resilient foundation and buffer that allows almost as a platform for us to stand up on, similar to what Scott Barry Kaufman talked about on our last base camp. This is that foundation that you stand up on and then you're able to be in the world, to grow, to pursue, uh, explore, love, um, and achieve a, a higher purpose. And, and maybe really that is the, the at the far end of the other side of the mental health spectrum, um, something that, you know, maybe we don't ever fully achieve or realize, but something that we aspire to and have confidence in our ability to, to head in that direction. So I don't know, just a thought that came up. Yeah. Andrew. Yeah. So when it comes to these risk factors, right. Genetics, social determinants, trauma, biology, habits, lifestyle, you know, again, um, you know, people are arriving at the table with, with all, a huge variation in these things. And, and it can vary across the year and um, circumstances, age, et cetera. So, you know, I, again, I want to take it back to something that we can all measure, right? So let, let's say you're somebody who has a trauma. We can define trauma. We actually have an episode coming out with Paul Conti soon. He's a brilliant uh, psychiatrist and very, very holistic thinker around trauma. And he defines trauma as some event that um, you, you experience changes your biology and psychology in a way that makes you react differently to things in the future in a way that's not helpful, right? So this idea that we all have trauma, he would argue not necessarily so. Many people do, right? Many more. But the idea that we all have trauma, well, maybe not. But the idea that everything bad that doesn't feel good is traumatic, he would argue that's also not true, right? There are many things that are just horrible interactions, but they don't traumatize us. They don't fundamentally change the way that we react to future events but some do. So let's say you're somebody who has trauma and you're working through that, or you're somebody who, um, whose habits and lifestyle um, are creating a, a, a diminished mental health. Well, how can you know that? Well, I would say go right back to this, this meter of how regularly are you able to get quality sleep, sunlight, movement, nutrition, hydration, and social connection. And you could say, well, you know, you can do all those things and still be miserable. And I, I agree, but I think you'll be hard pressed to find many people who are legitimately depressed or who are um, experiencing a thought or a, a pretty, you know, a, an impairment in, in thought or mood disorder who are getting all of those um, things on a regular basis. I'm sure they're out there, but they're sort of in, incompatible with one another at some level. So I think that, so for any of us, we should assess, you know, what is our risk? right? Genet through genetics or social determinants, trauma or biology or habits or lifestyle, what is our risk? And that risk level will define how much effort it will take to access sleep, sunlight, movement, nutrition, hydration, and social connection, right? Somebody who is having a severe psychotic episode is going to have a very hard time, right? To just kind of take one far end of the continuum. Someone, I'll give an example, um, you know, so how some of this can be transient and we can think of mental health also in terms of not full diagnoses, but life events that happen to all of us. So uh, I've been feeling pretty good lately, but on Saturday of this last weekend, I uh, had a great weekend. And then Saturday evening, an email came in with some pretty disturbing information, not related to me, but it, it activated me in a way that um, led to a really poor night's sleep, like just horrible sleep. I didn't sleep much at all on Saturday. Now I'm, I'm, you know, because of my career and because of my own uh, deficiencies, there've been, you know, I pull all nighters from time to time. Um, and I don't like to do it, but I don't do it much anymore. So I can survive it. But you know, the next day I was struggling and, and struggling to process the information and, and then Sunday sleep wasn't so great. And so for me, 
you know, was I mentally ill? Well, to some extent, yeah, that's kind of a mental illness, right? My mood was off, my energy was off, my ability to work and focus. And I, I, in some sense, it, it's like a, it's a mood impairment for sure. It's an energetic impairment. If that were to persist for several weeks or more, sure, that's mental illness of some sort, right? It's not paranoid schizophrenia, but it's, 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 it's bad. You, you can't function. So under those circumstances, realizing that, you know, a couple of things come to mind. I realized um, from experience in being in a sleep deprived state and, uh, you know, I need to get back to the fundamentals of sleep, sunlight, movement, nutrition, hydration, connect, social connection. That's what's going to allow me to restore mental health very quickly. And I, I like to think that's what happened. So again, I, I sort of revert to this almost like, uh, like ridiculously simple physical practices, because in those moments, we can start to wonder whether or not we really are experiencing a true mood disorder or not. You won't know until you get back to those fundamental practices. Now, along the lines of impairment, right? I think we have to ask, you know, what, what do we do when we are experiencing a deficit in mood or thought in a way that's really challenging? Now, some, I just want to point out, and this is not for liability reasons, this is just the facts that some thought disorders, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression as well, uh, major depression, um, you know, different forms of mania, et cetera, can distort thought to the point where people aren't aware that their thoughts are disrupted, right? Being sleep deprived is a, is a, is a different example because you know the cause. You, you're aware that you're quote unquote, not yourself. But some mental health issues, you know, people don't have the awareness that they are not themselves, right? Somebody in a really high peak of a manic episode will not want to come down from that manic episode because they don't realize they're manic right? They don't, uh, they don't get it. Um, it's not the way the brain works. Now, I think for most people, the key thing toward ongoing mental health is to have ways to reset quickly when we find ourselves sleep deprived, lacking sunlight, movement, nutrition, hydration, social connection, et cetera. And I, I see two or at least two behavioral practices that are very good for that. Um, the first one is having some practice that allows you to do what's what I call deliberate decompression to, to let this, the valve off of stress. Okay. Um, in order to get better sleep, but also just to release some of the stress in a healthy, non-destructive way, non-destructive to you, non-destructive to other people, you know, because there are destructive ways of relieving stress, right? I would argue without, um, you know, I'm not a teetotaler or anything, but I would argue that using alcohol or any other substance to control your stress is, is not the best way. Um, that's a, you know, I'm not going to cast judgment on whether or not people rely on those things, but it's certainly not the best way because it's not coming directly from you. It's not an ability. It's an access to something. So deliberate decompression is some behavioral practice that allows you to reset to those uh, critical five things. Um, I've talked endlessly on the internet about NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And one of the reasons I coined that acronym is because I don't care or have any stake in whether or not that non-sleep deep rest is NSDR. You can find zero cost NSDR scripts online. Made4 has one on YouTube. There are now many of them out there. Uh, whether or not you do yoga nidra, whether or not you do a breathing practice that involves mostly you know, longer exhales, whether or not you decide to do meditation, whether or not you decide to get that from a quiet walk or, you know, it doesn't, or, or cooking, whatever relaxes you, right? A deliberate decompression from the stress, I think is critical to have. And then the other one, which the science also supports is having a practice of gratitude, finding something that you're grateful for um, and both giving and receiving gratitude. Now, why are like, these are basic things, right? Sleep, gratitude, et cetera. But why is it important to have these ways to reset when you're impaired? Well, first of all, I should just mention that no one should expect themselves to incorporate these practices and have them work if you haven't already practiced them in advance of the stressful episode, right? The, we, the best time to learn a tool is when you don't need that tool. Um, you know, if you, if you've never driven, I don't recommend you doing this unless you can do it on a track or with a driver. It's kind of fun to do years ago. I took this like for fun. I took this tactical driving course. And it's like, you, you learn how to drive really fast toward a cyclone fence and then slam on the brakes. It's something that most, you never want to have to do this in the real world. Right. 
but you experience what it's like to get tossed forward against your seatbelt, like it is a heart, you know, and get pushed forward. It's, it's a, it's an experience that you can, it has to be felt. Right. Um, but it's great because if you have to have to break hard uh, in the real world, you know what that's like. You've driven there, right? You've been there. And I would say these things like deliberate decompression that you do on a daily basis or maybe every other day or so are a practice for those kinds of events in life when you need to let steam out of the valve or recover sleep that you've lacked the night before because some real life event came in. And the expect you can't expect yourself to learn how to just shed stress from a breathing exercise, having never done it before, right? So, and there are a number of examples. Pat and I earlier were talking about because he's a former Navy SEAL and we've done some scuba diving together. Um, you know, you never want to have to do the emergency share air scuba diving thing without having learned it in the the training, which allows you to actually get licensed to scuba dive. Um, and I've actually had the not fortunate experience of having to do that as a real emergency. Pat was on that trip. And so it, it was a terrible situation really, but made okay, made all okay, frankly, by the fact that, that that process was just reflexive at that point. So I would say that deliberate decompression, NSDR, or, or things like it are need to be practiced at least every other day or three times a week minimum, so that when you're sleep deprived, you can do that. Um, and gratitude practices are useful in their own right as well. They generate, we know, positive neurotransmitters, the serotonin system in particular. Being able to tap into that as a source for reset is extremely valuable. It's also valuable to do in its own right, as I just mentioned. And how do you get good at these practices? By doing them when you don't need them. And I think a sign of, I would, so I would add to our five things, are you getting quality sleep of ample duration, 80 to 85% of nights? Are you getting sunlight, especially early in the day, but even through cloud cover, 80 to 85% of days? Are you getting some form of movement? Could even be a walk, but other forms of more intense movement, if that's your thing, 80 to 85% of days, quality nutrition and hydration, quality social connection, et cetera. Plus, are you practicing some sort of deliberate decompression three times a week as a tool that you might need, but also a tool that benefits you in the short term? And do you have some sort of gratitude or appreciation practice that can allow you to self-generate these positive neurochemicals in a way that when things are really rough, you can look to and say, you know, maybe something just as basic as, you know, I often will tell myself, well, I'm breathing and I'm ambulatory. And for those of you that might not even be ambulatory for whatever reason, you can say, well, I'm breathing. And that, that doesn't really work when things are really bad, unless you've already trained up your system to really understand just how powerful a gratitude practice is. So, you know, these again are practices that we've all heard of, but I don't think that we've really thought about them or contextualized them in the broader framework of mental health. And I think that most mental health experts are doing a wonderful work, but they are mainly focused on mental illness and these impairments, the things that prevent us to get into all this. So for those of us that are dealing with mental health issues in mild form or moderate form, or are not dealing with them at all in a given moment, what do you do to maintain mental health? You lean into these practices harder. Most of mental health, I would argue, is preventative or it's restorative using tools that you've already built into your system. And the last thing I'll say about this is I was very careful to ask Dr. Conti, because he's a psychiatrist, he can write scripts for medication, what his thoughts were on medication. And he had a very interesting take on it. He said, first of all, we, especially in the US, we are a country that is very good at starting medications, not so good at ending medications, right? Um, most of the, the, the drugs, because that's what they are, that designed to treat depression, anxiety, and psychosis are quite effective in raising one's tolerance for stress. But what's often not put into the prescription is the whole purpose of raising tolerance to stress is so that you can now go and sleep, get sun, get movement, get hydration and nutrition, access social connection, and pursue meaningful work and relationships, right? The, the, the idea that you are going to be restored just by shifting your chemical state is not factual and it will never be factual. And I think that we, I don't think medication is bad or good. I think we just need to see it for what it is. It provides, a, it provides leverage 
to get to the behaviors. It does not restore or create behaviors. And so I think there is a place for medication, but we shouldn't be at all surprised that, you know, the kid that's having severe anxiety gets on an anti-anxiety medication and is feeling better, but then nothing really changes. Well, nothing changes because the behaviors haven't changed, you know, as, or as a different physician friend of mine says, you know, better living through chemistry still requires better living. And so here, what we're talking about and trying to really define is what is better living. And I will go back to now, we have a list of seven things just to sound like a broken record, but in case anyone missed them, it's quality sleep, 80, 85% of the time, sunlight each day, mostly in the early part of the day, movement, nutrition, hydration, social connection, some form of deliberate decompression that you both practice and implement when things get challenging. And by things, I mean, mood and or the five things listed above and some sort of gratitude practice because that's these are cost-free tools they require time, but no money, really. They're not something you purchase. They're not a, a supplement or an app. Um, you can have access to them. And they put you in a mode of being able to bolster your, neg- your, your mental health. They provide additional buoyancy. And I love this analogy of buoyancy because as Pat pointed out to me earlier, I used to talk about this as a ship that wants to leave harbor. And unless the tide is high enough, the ship can't leave. But that implies that these things are all just to get you out to sea. That's not the way it is at all. If you have a buoyancy, even if you get pulled underwater, you get into an argument with somebody, you can have the recognition in your mind. I know I can recover from this later today. I'll sleep fine tonight. You don't start spinning out. You have a buoyancy. You know, you can pop back to the surface. Wow. Wow. Um, So many gems in there, Andrew. Um, from the foundations. And then uh, obviously when you get knocked off your foundation or you can't engage these practices, what do you default to? Um, uh, NSDR, gratitude, some form of some, some form of recovery. Um, but then knowing that the time to pull on those tools and to lean into them or to cultivate and develop them isn't when you get knocked down. It's actually when everything is fine. That's when you start building out your toolkit so that when you do get um, you do get knocked down in the future. You know exactly what to go to. You know what your protocols are, what your what what's effective and what works for you, not because of something you've read, but because you've done this in the past and it's worked for you and you felt the effects of that. And obviously you and I spent a lot of time uh, inside Made For talking about how do we make these practices, these these mindsets that we're trying to cultivate, not so much a deliberate effort that, that requires um, a big lift on our part, but how do we make them more reflexive so that we just get better about building resilient foundations in in real time all the time so that we're already always ready. And the way of being, I think sets us up best for success. And I just, I couldn't help but think as you were talking, um, I kept going back to, I I was thinking about some, some times in my, my military training and hell week in particular, I know this gets, this cut gets covered a lot, but in hell week, most of your foundation gets completely stripped out from under you. You don't sleep, uh, you're cold, you're um, running everywhere. So you're physically totally just broken. Uh, most people start hell week sick. So your, your sense of, um, uh, you know, overall health and just well-being going into hell week. And then obviously throughout hell week is just, it's kind of shattered. And so I was thinking, well, what are you left with? What is it that you're going to? One is hydration and food. They give you as much food as you want to eat and you have as much water as you want to drink. And so you lean very heavily into that. But I think even um, as important as that is you get really good at cultivating and um, practicing gratitude in real time. Uh, this, this having this orientation to recognize what's good in my current environment or with my current situation, uh, how can I focus on that good thing as a way to give me fuel to whether this, you know, this particular challenging part of training so that I can get to the next, you know, the next few steps and the next few steps. So gratitude is something that you get really good at and have to lean into as a real tool under these um, really hard forms of stress. The other one that we haven't really talked about is humor, the ability to find the humor in any situation and, and laugh. And um, whether you're, you're giving that to a friend um, or a friend is giving that to you, if you can laugh in a moment of extreme duress, 
or try to find a way to find the humor in it, very quickly, I think you'll notice that the pain dissipates and you're just, you're given a little bit of fuel to go a little bit further till you're at a point in time where you can lean back into these practices or maybe you have more control. So uh, just something that came up, but I don't know how, how you think about humor and mental health. Uh, yeah, I mean, a humor and, and a sense of levity are extremely valuable. I mean, I, I think that, um, it, it, it's essential. Um, I think having, we have varying levels of access to that. So I'll just kind of, I was just trying to think back to, you know, Saturday, it'd been such a blissful weekend and this, you know, got hit square in the face with this information, you know, and, um, and again, this wasn't anything that happened to me. I I've been advocating very hard for somebody and, um, and, and, uh, hoping to bring some relief to, to their life situation and discovered that there was a setback. So my, in that mode, of activation, I, I don't think I would had access to humor. It was just, it was just frustration. And, and, uh, um, I, I like to think I'm human and, and this is a human response, but the lack of sleep is really frustrating because then you, you know, I'm not sleeping and therefore this is going to be more difficult. And that's when you have to get, get, take that exit ramp. And sometimes that exit ramp to resetting is humor. Um, state shifts are interesting. This isn't the topic of today's conversation, but, you know, I think that in the field of neuroscience, there's a lot of interest now in not thinking so much about emotions, but thinking about states, states have an intensity, they have a, a duration, whereas emotions are very hard to classify, right. And, and states where, you know, our entire way of being seems to be this, you know, altered where we're not the same person, right. Is, um, is something that is very troubling to us. Um, children are, are very prone to dropping into states, right? A tantrum state for a child is very hard to exit, you know, and um, as children get older, they learn to manipulate that where they, you know, if you give me what I want kind of thing, I'll stop tantruming, but that's not the kind of tantrum I'm referring to. I'm talking about the kind of tantrum where the child really is melting down. Um, you sometimes see this in the supermarket or something, and it's always uncomfortable. And because you realize like that there, if you have a, a moment of empathy, you go, they're really suffering. Like in their world, they, like the world is falling apart. And of course, as the adult, you have to maintain clarity that that's not what's happening. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, you know, adults are prone to these states also where what drops away? Well, the first thing that drops away as we get kind of um, frustrated or angry or stressed or, or depressed is, is the first thing is this recognition that things will be better, right? There's something that's really uh, has almost a gravitational force to negative states where we um, lose the perspective of time. We lose the perspective that this is going to get better. And so people start behaving and acting and thinking as if this is going to go on forever. That no one ever has that issue with happy states unless they're in a manic episode. It's really interesting. If you're feeling really great, you never think, oh God, this is just going to go on forever. Typically it's, gosh, I really hope I can hold on to this wonderful state or you're lost in it. But when we're in negative states, there is a change in our perception of time that, gosh, this really just feels like where I'm going to be. It's very hard to imagine being in another state uh, of mind and body, that is. So I, I think that the, again, the returning to these now seven uh, basic fu foundational tools is so key because they take the guesswork and the mystery out of um, or the mysteriousness, I should say, out of our mental states. Um, I think for, to answer you more directly now, Pat, I think that I would have a hard time accessing humor in a really d distraught state. But once I get some sunlight and a good night's sleep, I'm good. Like, I, you know, I, I, am, I can reset from one good night's sleep pretty quickly. And, and I've used NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, for years as a way to recover some of my mental functions that I've lost due to lack of sleep, because admittedly, I, I was sleeping far less than I needed to for a long time, just by way of career and life demands. Um, so I think that one thing I want to make sure that we surface is that one of, the, I believe one of the reasons that people overlook these seven things, they sort of diminish them and think of them as just, yeah, that's like the advice that our mother gave us. And that's just, yeah, that's just the basic stuff. Give me the thing. Give me the tool. Well, there are some tools. I've talked a lot on podcasts and elsewhere about the physiological side, two inhales through the nose really deep, and then a long exhale until your lungs are empty as at least to my knowledge, the fastest way to decompress in the short term in real time. 
It's a valuable tool, I believe. I didn't discover it. It's completely cost-free to you. And believe it or not, it was built into your genome. There are literally circuits, neural connections designed specifically for the physiological side. So this isn't breath work. It's not a hack. It's a, it, that would be like saying your heartbeat is a hack. This is something that you do when you're stressed, but you can also do deliberately. You can do when you're low in oxygen or people do this in sleep apnea, but you can do this to recover yourself. So again, inhale through the nose really deep. Then another inhale, even if a tiny one also through the nose and then a long full exhale through the mouth. Very powerful um, in terms of ability to deliberately decompress quickly. But the problem, like I think that the issue is that the reason this stuff gets overlooked, it doesn't get written down next to the prescription of the antidepressant is because these practices are very circular. Think about them. You get sleep one night, excellent, but you still have to do it the next night and the next. You get sunlight one morning, you're not off the hook. You have to do it the next night and the next night. Movement, even though it, actually we have a podcast episode out now that shows that one exercise session can improve cognitive function, but it's not permanent, right? You have to exercise again and again. Um, nutrition, hydration, we drink water and it flows through us. We eat food, it flows through us. Social connections, there's no one social connection that will, that will keep you sated forever. And so what sometimes happens, I think, is we look at these things and we say, yeah, but it's all so fleeting. I just want to change. I just want to be a happy person. But it's the regular pra practice of these ongoing things that really uh, sets that buoyancy. But then there are the things that actually change us, right? They are the things that fundamentally change us. And I think that those are the ones that ratchet up to these higher level concepts that we can only approach once the foundational tools are being met on a regular basis. And those higher level concepts and practices relate to what... You know, Pat, you've you know beautifully described as purpose, mattering, and coherence, which is a, you know safety, right? I think that you know purpose and meaning are just so fundamental, and I want to point out what this what these mean. Purpose and meaning can come from a relationship to anything, to work, to a person, to a set of um, experiences. Um, indeed, some people who experience tremendous trauma work through that trauma, and then they eventually come to a place where they put meaning on those experiences in a way that actually gives them perhaps, I mean, I wouldn't wish trauma on anybody, but perhaps more buoyancy in life and more purpose than had they not had those traumatic experiences before. I think this is what we all, you know, dream of for people, not just for ourselves, but for people, especially now in the wake of just, you know, just, I mean, let's just be fair to what it is just devastatingly horrible circumstances this last week. Right. So, um, or occurrences. So purpose mattering and coherence are what we get access to when we are taking care of the seven other things regularly. And I think that purpose mattering and coherence are foundational to mental health. You know, at some point we need to figure out what it is that we're going to do that is not just circular, right? The, the reason I say seven things that are circular but required and then purpose mattering and coherence are really about things that you can create that are of real permanence. And again, this could be creative works and art and music. I'm not an artist or a musician. It could be um, political change, if that's what you're after, or scientific discovery. It could be teaching and sharing. It could be um, anything that, that fundamentally is, you're, you are different. Much like with trauma, you are different afterward than you were before. You react differently to the world going forward. But in this case, unlike trauma, we're talking about changing in a way that makes you better equipped to access the foundational seven things, better equipped also to inspire other people to pursue mental health. You become a reparative mechanism in the world, right? And that's very hard to do if you're not in a healthy mental place. I mean, imagine the therapist that's mentally ill, right? Imagine the doctor that has poor judgment due to lack of sleep. These people exist, but let's, thankfully they're in the minority. So at some point we all need to ask, you know, what is it that's going to bring meaning of and permanence, a sense of permanence that my life matters, right? And that will change over time. When I was an undergraduate, for instance, I can only speak to my own experience, getting, I, I was a terrible high school student. I barely finished high school. Getting through university and performing well was the sole goal of my life. Now I didn't take care of the seven other things as well as I could have or should have, but 
when I graduated, the meaning shifted to something else and eventually it shifted. And nowadays it means something else. So meaning is something that's updated and is highly contextual. But the idea is that meaning, mattering, and coherence change you fundamentally. They make you mentally healthier. But, and this is a very important caveat, if you pursue purpose, mattering, and coherence to the exclusion of the seven foundational kind of circular things, you not only won't achieve them, but you'll actually be potentially driven towards mental unwell, unwellness or mental illness. Why do I say that? Well, how many people do we know that pursue some huge goal, right? This is the goal, this job, this relationship, this paycheck, this IPO, this whatever. And they don't take care of the foundational elements. And as a consequence, they get those things. And I see and hear from these people all the time. They're like, I don't feel any motivation. I, the money didn't mean anything, the success. Well, of course it didn't because you weren't well going through it. How do you expect to be well at the end, right? So all of these things are necessary, but not sufficient. And I do think that we can divide tools for mental health into the seven foundational buoyancy creating, but circular things. Completing them is necessary, but it's not sufficient, but is absolutely necessary. And then we have the purpose mattering and coherence as vital for mental health. Those are creating matters of permanence that can also be raising kids for that matter. Talk about permanent um, or pets or doing whatever kind of work is meaningful to you in, in the world, work broadly construed. And then we, earlier we talked about having reparative tools so that when you're exiting that cycle of health, you can get yourself back in very quickly despite your, your circumstances. And then just to recap again, all of this of course is riding on a vulnerability of risk factors. And that we'd be, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that, that for the paranoid schizophrenic in a psychotic episode, this stuff is like, this is you know way outside the range of reach, right? But for the person who's experienced mild depression or is making it through depression, you know, if you're, that person really stands to, Yes, it might take a lot more work. It might take 20 minutes each morning in the sun. It might take you know, more effort at creating social connection because they don't have that, right? They have to, you know, and so that's where things like medication and therapy support can really can add additional um, leverage. But I think we have a couple of different circles in this Venn diagram that hopefully what we're doing here is we're, as scientists, we, we say we're providing an organizational logic. None of the information here is completely new. You can find any of these pieces in multiple places, but we're trying to bin them in ways that allow you to, to conceptualize them and hopefully access them more easily. Andrew, one thing that um, I, I stuck on that, that you said is this, this idea of just meaning in life. And obviously if, if you have found, if you're finding meaning in life, then um, it probably means that that's a good indicator that you have um, a positive um platform of mental health that you're working off of. And I think the interesting thing about meaning is that meaning doesn't imply happy, that we're not always in this constant state of happiness, that things are going to happen. We are going to be depressed from time to time. We are going to get sad. We're going to get lonely. We're going to feel distracted or disconnected. But if we're finding meaning in the highs and the lows, um, then, then overall and in general, um, our outlook on life is going to be more positive. We're going to have a more positive regard for the people that we're connected to. We're going to have a more positive regard for ourselves, And in that, we're going to have more certainty and confidence and, and agency in engaging these behaviors and ultimately uh, unlocking potential within, within inside us. And, and the other thing that struck me is that as a component of meaningful life talked about purpose. Um, in my mind, I think about, you know, we've gone through these, these seven areas or these seven foundational practices for, uh, that are, that are really critical to mental health, but, um, purpose is that thing that allows you to, to drive that engine, right? We can have all the information in the world and be armed with all the protocols, but at the end of the day, we still have to do it. And why is the reason that, what, what is it that inspires us to do what we need to do to show up better for ourselves and for those around us? And uh, to the extent that you can have clarity of that purpose, um, that is going to help you inspire you to get into action. And, um, I just, two things that, two things that, that struck me, um, in your comments. So yeah, what, as a, as a quick note, you know, I think that, um, you know, as soon as we get into a discussion about mental health, you know, there are all these, there are additional concepts, of course, like nothing we're talking about here is exhaustive. It's not covering all the possible, um, 
and related themes. Like for instance, you know, in, in the therapy world, there, there are these issues of like self-worth, right? Like, you know, I didn't know this, but there are a lot of people that don't exercise because they think it's selfish, right? I never knew, I never realized I've always enjoyed exercise. So, and I've never wondered if it was selfish. I enjoy it and I hear it's good for me. So I'm happy to do it. So, but I didn't realize that some people actually were raised in a way that they believe they feel it's selfish. It's a, it's like, it's a bad thing to them. It's, it's not as bad as stealing, but it's, it's kind of akin to stealing. Like, why would I do that? That's selfish. And so one, and so a lot of therapy is aimed at kind of re-examining in, you know, scripts that we have and concepts that we have. And, and I, I would argue that's great that people do that kind of examination. But if we were lived in a world where the, these five or ideally these seven zero cost and necessary components of mental health were just sort of understood, like if you want to walk, you have to go right foot, left foot. And if you want to survive, you have to inhale and exhale. Like if you just, if these were just sort of written into our, the life script of these are the things that we have to do in order to be healthy, I think that we can bypass a lot of the uh, analysis of, you know, why is it that I don't feel I'm, you know, worthy of being happy, right? These are the deeper concepts that deserve attention in the therapeutic context. But again, without the foundational tools, there is no opportunity to really examine those things well. It's like, if you are a pair of, of, of glasses or of, of goggles, you have to say, okay, your goggles can be foggy. They can be completely occluded or they can be nice crystal clear. I always think of these things are the, the things that give me buoyancy or that make my goggles clear, uh, you know, and, and uh, Pat, we've had conversations with, with people that we know where we will use this phrase, like your, your, your goggles are foggy. Like someone's not really seeing things clearly because we know that that's not the full cap- their full capability. Now, in terms of meaning and purpose, I, I want to really emphasize something there, you know, meaning and purpose, if we wanted to get reductionist about it, relate in some way, in some way, but I think still a strong way to the two major reward systems in the brain. One is the dopamine reward system and the other is the serotonin reward system. Broadly speaking here, you know, uh, there's a lot of exception to this, but a nuance, I should say, but what I'm about to say is true. When we are in pursuit of things that we don't have, relationship, work, finances, children, pet, travel, whatever, we are accessing this motivational and dopamine system. When we are experiencing, and that generally is experienced as pleasurable or at least activating us, it puts us into a forward center of mass to steal your language, Pat. Forward center of mass is supposed to back on our heels. The serotonin system is one in which we experience pleasure just thinking about what we have. It's not necessarily gratitude, but it's, oh, my belly's full with food, like I'm good. I'm, I'm with the person that I want to be with right now. I'm good. The, um, I'm here with my dog. I'm not here with my dog, but I know that feeling very well from when he was alive. Like, I'm good. We're together. Like me and Costello, we're good. That's the, that serotonin system. There's nothing to go get, right? Now, so purpose and meaning evolves from a, having both of those in place. And I can't give you enough. I have so many examples is the way I should have said it. So many examples of people who get into just pursuit, but not appreciation of what they have or rec- no pleasure from their immediate circumstances. There are also a lot of people who get so much pleasure from their immediate circumstances. They're not really in pursuit. And who am I to judge? But I, I think a healthy, a mentally healthy relationship to pleasure is when we derive pleasure from things that don't diminish our pleasure in the long run. They're not destructive. So I, yes, I am anti anything behavior or substance that diminishes your ability to have pleasure in the long term, right? That's just, I think, reasonable um, to, to say, or put differently, addiction and things like it are a nar- progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure to the point where eventually nothing brings you pleasure. Whereas mental health, I think, is a progressive expansion of the things that bring you pleasure. How do you access that? How do you access more pleasure all the time and meaning and purpose? Well, by expanding the range of things that you can derive pleasure from, but also from having some sense of meaningful pursuit. And I think Paul Conti has this beautiful quote. He didn't set it on my podcast and that one hasn't come out yet. But when he was on Tim Ferriss's podcast, he said something like, and I'll get this partially wrong, but he said something like, people want to know what dopamine is for, but that's like asking what a dollar is for. And this is Paul's quote, to be clear. That's like asking what a dollar is for. A dollar doesn't do anything. It depends on what you spend it on. Right, and so meaning is when we are spending these neurochemicals of pursuit in a me- in in a way that we feel fundamentally changes us for the better. It's the exact opposite of trauma, 
And so we should ask ourselves when we, when, if we're getting dopamine from some pursuit, what are we pursuing, right? Once we're in a position to be in pursuit, what are we pursuing? Are we pursuing things that are circular or are we pursuing things that grow us over time? Are we pursuing, um, you know, relationships that help us connect the past, the present and the future? Or are we in relationships that feel very circular and kind of fleeting? And for me, this is an extremely um, useful way to conceptualize this because dopamine, as Dr. Conti points out, is available to us through all sorts of things. You know, it, you could even make, if you wanted, the seven foundational practices, sleep, sunlight, movement, nutrition, hydration, social connection, deliberate decompression, and gratitude, your source of dopamine. But I would argue, then you're literally just walking around in a circle, right? I do believe that humans are different than other animals. Other animals would be content to have all of that. And, you know, gratitude practice may be aside, you know, but they, they have all, at least the, the five things. They don't do well socially isolated. They don't do well without food or sleep or movement or sunlight, et cetera. So I think that we, we are a species that because we can anticipate the future very powerfully moves from mentally not well to mentally well when we are in pursuit of things that excite us because those things change us in the long term. They change our life circumstances. They really take us not from just a place of buoyancy, but it's almost like they give us lift out of the water, right? We can now travel to a different location in the water, um, so to speak. Andrew, um, you mentioned Costello, um, and not to focus on a, on a detail, but uh, I know how important Costello was to you and how um, important, such an important member of your, he, of your family he was. Um, but when you talk about him now, you're able to do so with a smile and remember the fond things. Do you attribute that to the foundation that you have in place when it comes to some of these practices that we're talking about, or what is it allows, what is it that allows you to talk about Costello and not find yourself, you know, in a place of sadness? Yeah. Well, I, incidentally, we have an episode on grief coming out. And I should mention it was not in the, we had no idea about the events that happened in Texas, of course, is prior when we recorded it, but uh, just so happens. What, grief is an interesting one because grief, without getting into too much detail, involves reconfiguring our, our maps of relationship. Uh, and our maps of relationship, this gets a little bit high level conceptual, it has to do with space, where we are in relation to these things that we love or animals or people, time, when we think we'll see them again. And in Costello's case, it's like he's gone, he's ashes, literally. And time, I'll never see him again, right? But the, then there's a third element in the map. This is very well understood from neuroimaging. And that third element is one of emotional closeness. And the process of grief is one of untethering from the space and time, because he's gone. And yet enhancing that feeling of emotional closeness. So the short, non-nerdy uh, answer is um, when I realized that the amount of grief that I was experiencing about him was in direct proportion to the amount of love and joy and shift in purpose that I felt from Costello. Also the amount of learning. I mean, he taught me a ton. I'm not the mellowest guy in case we haven't all figured that out. Um, and Costello taught me how to relax and he was a bit of a hedonist and he, and he was funny and like he, he gave me levity. And so, and so for me now, that all, you know, you are talking about Costello. I, I am not just tickled and amused by the fact that he existed. Like to me, he fills me with energy. Right. Um, and I have, it's crazy, right? He's a dog. He had no knowledge of any of this, but you knew Costello. And, and to me, this whole notion that like have it, I got him when he was literally this big and raising him and, and the whole purpose and meaning behind it was really a test of whether or not I could give as much of myself to another creature as possible while still maintaining my own health. And so there, this has so many, so the short answer is it's so multidimensional for me that the number of ways in which that relationship grew me that I just sit here and go, oh my goodness, like I don't need him now. I would love it if it was still here, but it was his time to go. I don't need him now, right? I just, I'm just sort of basking in the experience, but also just even as I say this kind of remarking at what an extraordinary um, point of growth he was for me. It just was, and so, and on and on. Also, he's just like, he was just a, the bulldog with a head is most, you know, he's like you, Pat. He's a, you know, big head, <laughs> big head, big limbs. You know, some people are just born with it, you know, you know, just like a hard head, you know, and um, 
And so, yeah, pure delight, but also it wasn't circular. I guess that that's the last thing I'll add. The relationship with him didn't come and go. It came and went in one form, but it's not circular. It's provided immense energy for me in a huge number of domains of life. Amazing, amazing. Um, Andrew, any parting thoughts? I know we're, we're coming up on time. Oh, goodness. Well, We've we covered, you've, you've covered a lot of ground today, so uh, hard to sum it up in one thing, but um, any yeah. final? Um, Maybe- yeah, sorry to, to, I've never been accused of being succinct and it's not about to happen anytime soon. Um, you know, I think parting thoughts, I mean, this is a particularly challenging week for, I think, everybody. I think anyone that's not, um, you know, just at least impacted and, and perplexed and, and wondering where, what to, where to go from here with the current events in the world is, is you know, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to know if there's anyone out there like that. The, um, but in addition, I think, you know, mental health, it, it takes work. That work does, does not take much time. It does take regularity. Um, it's not mysterious what those things are. I noticed that a few things popped up in the chat, you know, things like journaling, physiological size, that there are many music, some people for singing, music, dance, other, you know, these things, there's all sorts of other elements that feed into this mental health, but these things are there. And um, I think that if we can be regular about these practices, then these higher level things of purpose, mattering, coherence start to reveal themselves to us. I do want to say that, that I don't think it works to just walk up a mountain and go, what do I want to do with my life? That never works, at least not for me. It's in the it's in the the building of buoyancy that we start to feel like oh like I could risk um, the, my you know my feelings of comfort or I could risk my you know healthy risk of my feelings of anxiety in order to pursue something that that really would create more purpose or, or have creative ideas. So um, in case people haven't noticed by now, I really like structure and I like specific do outs and protocols to rob from the. Um, the military language do out, you know? So what, what are you going to do? I, I would hope that people would try and access these seven things. I would hope that they would try and think about purpose, matter, and coherence. And then to the extent that people need to um, do the hard work of figuring out like, why, why wouldn't I feel entitled to these things? Why wouldn't I, entitlement such a weird word, but why wouldn't I do these things naturally or just reflexively? I would say, look, you know, there's very few things that humans do reflexively that are good for us. You know, it takes, that's why you got a forebrain. Unlike, you know, Costello had a little forebrain, never saw, never looked at it, never did the neuroimaging experiment, but you know, he, if he made a lot of plans, he didn't really execute them. So, whereas we have this forebrain that allows us to use the past, the present and the future to create um, basically whatever it is that we want. So I'd encourage people to, you know, to use that is such valuable real estate. Amazing. Amazing. You know, something that, that I took away from this is that, you know, all of our situations are unique. Um, we have unique stressors, we have unique goals, we have unique challenges that we're facing. Um, some of us are under chronic stress, some acute, um, and no matter what we're facing, the recipe or the prescription, at least at a foundational level, doesn't change, right? It's these seven practices. It's, um, getting into action around these things in small ways uh, consistently over time to build that resilience, to build that buoyancy that allows us to lift up, to get some, um, a little bit of separation between what we're facing and maybe where we want to go so that we can start going where we want to go, or at least have greater confidence in our ability to progress towards our larger goals, um, uh, towards that, that end that, uh, is important to us. And so, um, can't ever overstate the importance of a, of a strong foundation. And um, that's my big takeaway today. So uh, thank you, Andrew, for being here, for sharing with us, for anyone that's um, on or listening, uh, that's at all been affected by what's happening in Texas, our hearts go out to you. Um, just tragic doesn't even begin to describe what what's happened. Um, but our hearts are, uh, our hearts are with you and um, wish you all the best. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everyone. Cheers. I see y'all.